Dave Meltzer with Entrepreneurs of the Playbook, and I have one of my heroes. I know they have Rogan's heroes, but this is Fred Rogan. He's going to give me the uh huh when I tell him he's the legend of sports casting, anchoring. I wanted to be an anchor. I went to Occidental College. Right. Uh, I'm old enough to have, have gotten you early in your career. I think you started in 1980. That's right. Here. Sure. Uh, here. Yes. And I want to start with because so many entrepreneurs and kids dream about getting different jobs in sports. Being a sports agent on that side, I have them all coming to me going, right. how did you do that? And right. I said, you got to connect the dots backwards. You can't do it forward. But you actually, in your career, uh, despite you, I think you had a mom like mine that was doctor, lawyer, or failure when you decided to be a that's sports agent. That's accurate. I, I was going to be, I was going to be an attorney. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's absolutely right. And the problem was, as I was going through school, my mom always insisted I get great grades. I mean, that's the house I came from. And uh, I simply got tired of school. I mean, I had won a National Boys Club Award. I had a four-year scholarship paid to a college. I'm not going to mention the name because people will go, why didn't you take it? <laughs> and I just got sick. I got sick. Burned out? Or sick? I burned out. Yeah. Burned out of going to school. So I went six months to a junior college. And I was going to be an attorney an NBA referee, a major league umpire, and I went into the mass communications program at Phoenix College, the JC in Phoenix, and I was there six months, and I said, you know what, I'm ready to get a job. So I started. I have six months of junior college. That is my formal education, and I went off and started in radio in Globe, Arizona. And where did your passion for sports come from? Was it playing or watching or both? Both. Growing up, uh, grew up born in Detroit then moved to Phoenix. My dad was a huge sports fan. Didn't realize at the time he was also betting on the games. <laughs> that makes you a big fan. <laughs> yeah, so he, he was a huge fan, and we were big Lions, Tigers, Red Wings, Pistons. And uh, so I would go to the Lions games with him, and we'd go see the Tigers and the Pistons, and the, he was a huge Red Wing fan, huge Red Wing fan. And I developed a love for sports. So then I started competing if you can call it that, when I was a kid. We moved to Arizona and I continued to play, but I was always an enormous sports fan. So I knew that was something I wanted to get involved with. Somehow, some way, I wanted to be involved in sports. It was just what the vehicle was going to be to get there. And you have, obviously, a voice for TV and radio. You have this No, I have a face for radio. Yeah, I got a face for radio. I have a face for radio. <laughs> voice I have a voice. That, it's really, did, wh that when do people, because I, I will tell you, even at a young age, because I have a deeper voice, people say, Dave, you should get into announcing and broadcasting. You have a great voice for that, but you have a face for radio, so stick to the podcasting. Uh, really, though, what, what age did someone tell you that that is a profession that you may have a great career in? Or No one ever told me that. Really? Um, and my voice really didn't change. I got here when I was 23, and my voice had not changed yet. So this really happened to me when I got to be in my late 20s, early 30s, that it kind of dropped a few octaves. <laughs> yeah. Because prior to that, it was much higher. Uh, and I just think it was with age, my voice just dropped. It always had resonance, but it, it wasn't this low. Which is a great voice. Uh, now, from junior college, you went out and started making money. And, you know, I always tell people, don't limit your point of entry. You were looking for experience, and it wasn't as if you're going to the biggest network, you took a job in... Globe, so Arizona. Yeah. Right. I got paid $400 a month. I was a top 40 disc jockey. But in the process, I also was allowed to do the high school play-by-play. -play nice. Of the Miami Vandals and Globe Tigers. <laughs> so part of the deal was I had to be on every night as a top 40 disc jockey, and you had to sell your own show. So you'd go out and you sell your commercials for a buck a spot. Wow. Yeah. I wish we had buck. those rates. Yeah. A buck. <laughs> one, one dollar a spot. Commissions were high on that, I assume. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, I started there. And all I tried to do every day was get better. And I had a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder behind me when I was on the radio. And for every stop set and every introduction, I would roll this, this recorder. And then when the, the record started, I would listen back and hear what I sounded like every single time. Wow. And when I got to a point where I thought, okay, I was proficient enough to advance, I moved to Yuma, Arizona. There I made $750 a month, and I was the midday host, but I also got to do the play-by-play -play of the Kofa King High School team. So the thing was, I wanted to do play-by-play -play in every stop. And in Yuma, they had a TV station, and it was K-Blue, K-Blue Radio and TV. So I had been on the radio for a while, and I'd watch the TV, and back then it was even black and white. They didn't have color cameras yet. <laughs> and I went into them, I said, you know, I do the radio every day. I'd like to try out to be on TV. 
And the guy looked at me and he goes, are you crazy? We don't have tryouts here. You're on. Really? That's how I got on TV. That's awesome. So for TV, I got paid $5 a night. $5 a night for TV, $750 a month for radio. And in TV, I really had no training. So I was making it up as I went along. And they had no graphics or anything like right. that. So I created graphics. I used to get pictures out of Sports Illustrated magazines. And I would cut them out. And it would say, like, basketball. And I would put it in front of a green or a blue background. And then I got a camera and shot it with the graphic positioned exactly as it would be over my shoulder. And then we started using graphics. And that's how I created the graphics that I used. So all along the way, I learned how to do things, but I learned on my own. And from there, I went to Austin, Texas, which was the ABC station. And it was funny. What I did is I called all of the NBC stations I could find in a certain market range, because Yuma was tiny. And I said, I'm looking for a job. Do you have any opportunities? And they would tell me no, or please send a tape. And I always thought calling was better than just sending a resume and a tape. So I called NBC in Austin, and they told me they had just hired somebody. And I would always ask the same question. Anybody else looking in the market? Yeah. They said, well, maybe the ABC station. So I called them. They said, send the tape. I sent the tape. And they said, we'll get back to you. It was like four months later, they called me, and they brought me in, and they hired me in Austin. And it was great because they shot film in Austin. And they said to me, you know, here, you're going to have to go out and shoot your own stuff. You know how to shoot film, right? And you just lied. And I said, absolutely. I had no idea. <laughs> right. How do I know how to shoot film? But you know what I thought? Other people can do it. How hard can it be? I love that. So I got there, and I took the camera the first night, and I went out. And I came back, and it was out of focus, and it was green, right? <laughs> and it was shaking, and they looked at it, and I said, oh, my God. Something you, wrong you don't with know how to shoot. You, you <laughs> what is this? I said, well... I told you I know how to shoot film, but I'm not very good at it. I told you that. They go, yeah, you're right. We'll give you a photographer. So I had a cameraman. I worked there, and then an opportunity opened at NBC in Phoenix, where I grew up. I went to high right. school. So I talked to them, and a guy calls me. He goes, hey, do you know how to edit videotape? I said, absolutely. Of course I know how to edit videotape, but I'm not very good at it. <laughs> <laughs> so they hire me in Phoenix and I go and they had two editing stations back in the day. And you know, you would take turns and go in and edit your stuff. It took me three and a half hours to edit 15 seconds of oh, tape because I had no idea what I was doing. So they said, well, you backed everybody up. I mean, this is unacceptable. You said you could edit tape. I said, well, but I wasn't very good at it. <laughs> so they gave me an editor. <laughs> there you go. So every time I just figured, you know, I, I was proficient at some things and the rest I would just pick up along the way. And I was there. And then in 1980, the opportunity presented itself here at uh, NBC in LA. And I took that and I was 23 when I got here. Unbelievable. Yeah. And through that experience, you were covering multiple sports in multiple ways, voice, video, et cetera. Yeah, what I was trying to do back then was what is commonplace now. You know, I think a mistake that people make or did make for a number of years doing local sports is they were all nuts and bolts, diehard, very focused. You have to attack your audience. You have to understand your business. You know, I always say my business is now media. My assignment is sports. Excellent. So what I tried to do was, given the smallest percentage of the TV audience watches for local sports, research tells us that, the smallest percentage of the local TV audience is watching for sports, I thought to myself, well, what if I go after the largest percentage of the audience? I'll just do it differently. Hmm. I'll have fun with it. Right. I'll create parodies. I'll try to do different things. And that may attract that other segment of the audience, which fortunately for me, it did. And that's really how I started things here, by going after all the people that didn't really like sports. I'm a huge sports guy. I do talk radio every day. But I knew on television that wasn't going to work in a local market. So that's how we created the, the philosophy we, we did here. It's so interesting because growing up in the sports business world with the most notable sports agent, and you can imagine all the celebrities that we get, my wife, who grew up in San Diego but went to CSUN here in LA, right. I mentioned to her that I was doing this podcast with you today, and now she has been with Eric Dickerson and go, who is that? Right? Like, I mean, really big Hall of Famers. And I told her, oh, I'm going to, to Fred Rogan, you know, and she goes, oh, Rogan Hero. So right. you did what you did because there's no way she's watching sports, but exactly. she enjoyed what you did. Exactly. And also, 
um, we used certain production techniques. So we created Rogan's Heroes. We created the Hall of Shame. Yeah. I give an analogy I use in a lot of Which everyone's meetings. copied, by the way, right, well, all the way through. Yeah. Here, but here, you're the original. Here's the bottom line. If I had a bottle of water here and a bottle of water here, and one was DeSanti and one was Arrowhead, okay? And they were both sitting right here. If we opened the tops of the bottles, you know what we'd realize and had a sip? It's water. <laughs> right. It's water. Yeah. So what makes DeSanti different than Arrowhead? Why would this seem better if people consider it so it costs more? We know that. Is that what makes it better? It's all in packaging and marketing. Right. That's what distinguishes one thing from another in a world where basically everything is the same. That was the approach we took. We we're producers first and foremost. We're, we're television producers, and now we're media producers. And in doing things, the same content other people had, but doing it differently, it allowed us and enabled us to attract a different audience, which has sustained us for so many years. And it's interesting because I talk about different mediums that, it, and you know, in media now, there's so many different mediums and formats. You have to capture content differently, amplify it. And it's even, there's a strategy to perpetuate content, which didn't exist. And you were dealing with the first and the last real TV, right? Real time reality TV It's the first and the last is sports content. Oh, and, absolutely. And, and it will be. You've been able to transcend, I mean, over 50 awards and Emmys and gold. I mean, I know you're going to be humble about it, but... Somebody had to win. They gave it to me. Exactly. In, in the California Hall of Fame as well, you had the same attitude, which Tommy Lasorda and Warren Moon and Eric Dickerson and Oscar De La Hoya, I can go on and on. You can be as humble as you want because I'm a big fan of yours. Moreover, the reason I'm a fan is because as we transcend into the digital media side, your content still resonates the same way Disney, if you go on YouTube, you know, Walt Disney had no idea there'd be a YouTube. Right. But Mickey Mouse has 470 million views. Um, the difference of your content that I see, and I still use TV a lot for myself. They put this podcast, for example, on regional NBC Sports, and the young guys were like, I don't even own a TV. Why would you do that? Right. I'll tell you why. Because all the podcast listeners, when they found out that this was on regional TV, oh, they don't watch it there. It gave me extraordinary credibility. Yeah, and, and I think it still does that if you're on TV, even if they don't watch it, there's a different level of prestige or credibility. What do you see? Because it doesn't seem like you're on the road to retirement, even though you could at any time. What do you see in the next decade as far as content and, and sports and, and what you do? Where do you see how is it consumed or what would your strategy be for for someone. Okay, first I want to say that our stuff has transcended over the period of time because I've always worked with great people. I've always hired people that were really smart, really funny, and had a sharp eye. I never hired sports producers. You, you hired guys that were actually good at what they said they do. They yeah. get to say unlike me. <laughs> right? <laughs> unlike me. Yeah, because I already know that trope. Right. Um, <laughs> I, I never hired America's greatest sports producer. I always hired people with great production skills. And in doing so, and I always tell them, if I hire you and I have to ask you a lot of questions, or if you have to ask me a lot of questions, I don't need you. Mm -hmm. I need to learn from you. I need to grow from you. You have to make me better, I'll make you better. And even uh, with all your experience, you still hire that way. I mean, yeah. Steve is one of Steve Levitan, yeah. everyone knows. No, he's... all the guys that, that I'm fortunate enough to work with were, were brought in for that reason. Yeah. Teach me something. I always look at it like that. I want to learn and things evolve. So where do I see content going? Our world is now one of immediacy and urgency. It wasn't that way before. Back in the day, people would watch television in a passive way. It was your companion. It was your friend. It was the, the thing that was there that kept you entertained. Now, we have many friends and companions. We, we have digital world, we have our phone, we have a computer, we have an iPad, we have television monitors, we have things streaming on Netflix and Amazon Prime. Everything is over the top, everything is on demand. So how do you cut through? What do you do? Well, let's start with television. There must be an immediacy and an urgency or a difference to everything you do. There has to be. If, you, if this is the way we've always done it, that's not going to sustain because there are too many options available. So everything must be presented with urgency in the, in the present mind of immediacy. You have to convey that image to the viewer. And if it's not important to you, it's not important to them. 
right? If I don't, if I don't sell it, if I don't believe in it, it's certainly not going to be important to you because you have too many options. Next, you have to, you have to populate multiple platforms. So what does that mean? TV, for example, in TV news, TV news or TV sports, there's no end user. In any kind of programming, back in the day it was syndicated, there would be an end use. You would do a series, you'd have so many episodes produced, then you'd turn around and put in syndication, right? There was an end user. In our business, there is no end user because it's day of content. It happens and it's over. So what we have to do is create multiple platforms and create end uses for things. Example, hmm. if you take a television sportscast but you present it differently, it will fly on Snapchat, okay? If you have compelling content on television in the form of a debate, you can populate YouTube with that. And then you're looking at the certain demographic of the people that actually watch that stuff. Snapchat is young, YouTube is men, Facebook is older, Instagram is right in the middle. So you, you have to understand all the platforms and how to populate them, and then you have to tie everything together. So what we do on TV, we can put here, and we can put there, and then we can take it and put it here, and then we can package it differently and put it there. And in doing so, you're attracting a new audience every time because there are different people watching. So in our world today, content is king and production is critical. How do you put it together? And how does it appeal to different segments of the audience? When you figure that out in the new media landscape, you can be successful. Now, most people, I'm considered in that space, like the old man of the internet, the old mm -hmm. man of Instagram. You know, my teenage daughter's like, how do you have more followers than, than I do? But, you know, you are a seasoned veteran, but yet have your finger on the pulse. I think it's important for you to share your advice on, because there is a boom, the boomer era, and there's people that are turning 40, 50, 60, and 70 that still will be in this business. What advice would you give them of how do you stay on top of the multiple platforms and mediums and, and what appeals to who and how? Because you really, out of anyone of an age group where you're even a little bit older than I, I've never, like out of all the people I've met, I'm just sitting here going, oh my gosh, he really knows what he's talking about with the content and, and the mediums. What advice would you give to someone that's in their 60s that have worked for the same place for a long time of how you stayed on top of that? Well, I think first of all, honestly, if, if you've not evolved at all in this period of time, you're probably going to be in trouble. Especially media. I'm right. You're probably <laughs> going to be in trouble because the entire world has changed. I've been in television when it was at the zenith. <laughs> I, I'm right. And the literal zenith. Yeah. Half the audience knows what we're talking about. Exactly. Yeah. I'm in television now as its relevance has changed dramatically. So if you approach everything, and again, I'm a bit unusual because I'm more of a guy invested in our business than what I do. Nice. I take what I do very seriously. I don't take myself seriously. You know, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. How in the world would I ever get a job like this? If you saw me on the street and didn't know me, you'd run away from me. And I know that. <laughs> I'm well aware of That's that. That's what you said. Um, I think what you have to do is understand how people are consuming information and media and not be afraid. And also understand it's not going backwards. It's not going to change. Right. It's going to become more advanced. And accelerate faster. Right. And you have to have a skill set that talks to it. When I started in the business, it was called broadcasting. Why? There were few networks, few stations, and you appeal you appeal to the broadest part of the audience always. Okay. As cable came along, it became niche programming or narrow casting. That's why for sports, you have ESPN or Fox Sports 1. That's why for news, if you're conservative, you have Fox News. If you're liberal, you have MSNBC. If you, if you reckon yourself down the middle, you have CNN. But they're more they're liberal. Well yeah. <laughs> but everybody went after a segment of the audience. Because in today's world, if you're good at everything, you're good at nothing. Right. So you have to identify who you're going after how you will attack that market and what those individuals want. What we will put on Twitter is not what we will put on Snapchat. They're different audiences, of course. right? Yeah. What we use on YouTube 
We're not gonna use on Facebook. They're different audiences. So you have to figure out what audience you're going after and how to capture them. And that's why I think you have to evolve. You, you, you cannot be afraid. And you can't think, ah, these kids, ah. Right. Because it's not, it, they're the future. That's where we're at. That's awesome. La last question to that end, and it was nice that I got to get advice for the older generation for once on this podcast for the younger generation because one of the reasons I have the playbook and the playbook to success is because I do have an audience that's looking to accelerate their careers, right? They're entrepreneurs. It's featured number one entrepreneur podcast for a reason. And this question to me, with all the experience and success that you've had, what career advice, not just in media, but I would really want to know what career, device, career advice you would give to someone coming out of college with that same statement, I really don't know what I want to do. What advice would you give them? The first thing you do in life is you never chase money. Never chase money. Do something you love and money will follow. I think a big mistake people make is they chase money or they chase stardom or they chase fame or they chase acknowledgement. There's nothing wrong with rolling up your sleeves, learning something early, and then perfecting it. A problem I think a lot of people deal with today is, and unlike when we were growing up, you know, I'm in one place on TV 40 years. Right here. Okay, <laughs> 40 years. That's unheard of. That would never happen today. Because people That's like are the less... like Dodgers infield. Right. It didn't change for nine years. That'll never happen again. Right. I mean, <laughs> it will never happen because people think differently today. We buy homes. Younger people, A, don't want them, and B, can't afford them. Nah. They want to be more mobile. They want to be able to change. Their priorities are different. And I tell my kids all the time, I say, look, if you just stay focused and commit yourself to something and learn it, you will have a successful career. I always said here, you know, I... I I'm so appreciative of the opportunities I got here at NBC. And I said, you know what? I'd like to send other people in the city that are on other stations checks. And they said, why is that? I said, because you know what? Because they don't work as hard as I do. I've been able to succeed. And there's no substitute ever for hard work. And it's a question of priorities. I think a lot of younger people, they get to get out of college. They either want it right now yeah. Or they don't know what to do. And they become frustrated without knowing what to do. Right? Yeah. So then what do they do? They do nothing. <laughs> they do nothing. Well, there's nothing out there for me. It's like they say, you get a college degree today. What does it do for you? Not as much as it used to. Uh, now it has to be a master's. Right? Yeah. You need graduate school. Then you got to leverage your parents' uh, life for your own. No, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 So I would say... Don't be afraid to commit. There's an argument that some people use. Well, I'm so young, I don't know what to do. And if you do know what to do when you're young, you're unusual. I would suggest if you do know what to do when you're young, you're successful. Because every day people delay, and I tell this to the kids that come in and talk to us all the time. Every day someone delays, you delay, five people run ahead of you. They've raced ahead of you. Okay, delay two days. 10 people are now ahead of you in whatever you choose. So you have to have the strength and conviction to make a choice and then pursue it. You will be successful. In our business, I tell the kids all the time too, it's different than when I got in, quite obviously. And I always ask the same question, why are you here? When we have classes coming in, the kids come in, why are you here? And who wants to be a star? Raise your hand. I ask them every time, who wants to be a star? And I said, be honest, there's, there's no shame here. I'd say half of them go like this. And I always say, I look at them right in the eye and I said, it's great you're here. You will never make it. You will never make it. You will never be a star because you're here for the wrong reason. Wow. Who wants to be here and tell stories? Who wants to be here and report? Who wants to be here and learn this crap? The other half, you guys got a shot. Great advice. Yeah. People that chase fame rarely get it. Same with money. And if yeah. they do, they end up losing it. Yeah. So it's really true. Wow. Well, 
uh, once again, I wish I had more time, Fred. I appreciate and congratulate you, and I feel as if this should be watched and listened many times, and I'm gonna go back and listen for my own career because I believe in that commitment. Without committing, you can't evolve. No. And I think if I, what I've learned today about you that I didn't know is that evolution and you definitely what my mom always told me hey if you're the smartest guy in the room you're in the wrong room i picked that up from you you probably have the same philosophy yeah by looking at the people you surround yourself with so thank you so much for your time thanks for having me the legend fred rogan with dave Meltzer, entrepreneurs the playbook